Hey, it's me, Nalthazar, and welcome to another Magic the Gathering Puzzle Quest video. In today's video, I'm going to be going over the cards that caught my eye when I was looking at the spoilers for the upcoming set, Forgotten Realms. So, let's get into it. Now, unlike previous sets, I have all of the cards that I'm looking at in one video. And the reason for that is because there were less than 30 cards from the set that I was like, oh dang, these look like really strong cards. So it just seemed like the sort of general power creep that's been slowly coming forward is being reined in a little bit. And so there are fewer cards that seem to be egregiously powerful and more cards that just seem decent. And so there weren't as many cards that really stood out to me. Now, some of that is definitely due to the whole venture into the dungeon mechanic that is coming in the set. And so we really don't know what the dungeons are going to do in Puzzle Quest yet. So just at the time of my recording, we don't know what they're going to do. And so it's very possible that this list will double when we know what Venture Into the Dungeon does. Whereas it's also very possible that we'll see what Venture Into the Dungeon does, and it's just some like little sub-mechanic that's kind of cool and gimmicky. And so this list holds true. So just keep that in mind as we go. I'm going to be covering the Masterpieces first, then the Mythics, then the Rares, then the Uncommons, and then the Common. So I say Common because there's just one. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about the masterpieces, of which I think there are four. The first one is Fiend Slayer Paladin. This is a really cool card. It's 12 mana for a 5-5. Five five. It has protection from black and red, first strike and lifelink, vigilance, and when it deals combat damage, venture into the dungeon. Now, at the time of my recording, we do not know what the dungeon is that Fiend Slayer Paladin will enable you to enter when it deals combat damage. But nonetheless, even if we ignore that, uh, the bottom effect, which says as long as there are 10 or more black or red gems, this creature gains double strike, gives this creature enough going for it to be a good card that you'll probably put in some of your decks. 12 mana for a 5-5, five five, protection from black, protection from red, first strike, lifelink, and vigilance is already solid. Potentially giving it double strike makes it very good. And then with the possibility of the venture into the dungeon being good, that could make it potentially excellent. Especially if we get a new event where we're going to have to venture into the dungeon, this could be really good. Especially as with the double strike, it would be able to venture into the dungeon twice in one turn, potentially. We don't know what it does yet. So, anywho, I really like the idea of this card, and so it stood out to me in a, not like this is going to be the chase card of the set, but still pretty cool. The second card is Sword of Dungeons and Dragons. Honestly, if you've looked through the spoilers, I think that you'll see that there's a whole bunch of flavor in this set, uh, and you can really see that the devs probably had some really good fun picking out some of the cards that they threw into the set. Sword of Dungeons and Dragons is the first un card in Puzzle Quest, so like unhinged, unbalanced, or whatever those un sets are called. I only played the first one, unglued, I think. But anywho, it's just, they're, they're joke sets. Uh, but this card is not a joke. This card is terrifying. So it's 12 mana. It's an equipment. Uh, it's got the whole uh, equip for two down here. So when a creature you control attacks, if it's in your hand, it gains two mana. And while on the board, your first creature gets plus four, plus four, and gains hexproof. So that's just a passive hexproof uh, boost for your first creature. Uh, and the best card, in my opinion, in standard right now is a dragon called Velomachus, and Velomachus has Vigilance, which will put it as your first creature, meaning that Sword of Dungeons and Dragons plus Velomachus is not only going to boost Velomachus' power, which is going to make it so that you can pick up spells and give them even more mana, but you're also going to give the dang thing Hexproof, which means that this card is already amazing as a colorless card, as you can throw it in any Velomachus deck. So, Sword of Dungeons and Dragons, even if it just had the plus four, plus four, and Hexproof, I would still use this card, but that's not all it has. It also has, when your first creature deals combat damage to your opponent's Planeswalker, if you don't control a card named Adult Gold Dragon, create a copy of Adult Gold Dragon into play under your control. What Adult Gold Dragon does 
I have no idea. Maybe it's like an adult novel version of an adventure. Obviously, it's not going to be that, but I don't know. I really don't know. Anywho, it could be a type of support token that's going to give us mana or something, or it could be a dragon creature that's actually very terrifying. So whatever it is, I definitely think that sounds pretty cool. Then you're going to roll a d20. Now, this is the first time in this video that we're seeing that roll a d20. A d20 is just a 20-sided die. And what I'm really hoping is that when this triggers in Puzzle Quest, that we'll see an actual like digital 20-sided die roll and we'll see what the result is. I think that would be pretty cool. But nonetheless, so whenever a creature you control or the first creature you control deals combat damage to your opponent, you're gonna roll a d20. If that result is a one to 10, then you're gonna venture into the dungeon. What the dungeon is, we don't know yet. If that result is 11 to 19, you're gonna reinforce your dragon creatures. <laughs> Velomachus, buddy, I'm looking at you. <laughs> and then 20 perform each of these effects above. So uh, this card is very much Velomachus's best friend. The reinforce your dragon creatures does make me think that the adult gold dragon is gonna be an actual creature, but we don't know. Uh, but nonetheless, this card is absolutely phenomenal. We don't have anything that just passively gives our creatures hexproof right now, really. So yeah, this card is amazing. This is absolutely a chase card for me personally. It's not the chase card of the set where I'm going to get it and feel giddy for a few days, but it, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'll get this and play with it and be like, oh, <laughs> why does this exist? The UR Dragon. All right. Uh, this, this is my chase card for the set. Uh, that will make me feel really giddy if I get it because this card is disgusting. Uh, this is 26 for a 10-10. It's all five colors, so you can put this in whatever deck you want. At the beginning of your turn, if this card is in your hand or is in play, each dragon card in your hand gains three mana. This thing is a dragon. It can be in your hand and all your dragons get three mana per turn. It can be in play. All your dragons get three mana per turn. That's already really good. And then it has this secondary ability, which is just mind boggling, which is when a dragon creature you control deals combat damage to your opponent's planeswalker, draw a card and give it X mana, where X is the damage dealt that way. Th this, this thing is just so disgusting. Seriously. I mean, there are so many dragons in this set. And then we've got the elder dragons that we just got, like Velomachus and Tanazir and crew. Uh, Whoa, oh my gosh. Like the Silver Quill Dragon, which already has double strike and already draws you a card with half mana, is going to hit twice and then draw you two cards with this thing. This thing is going to be making it so you get all your dragons out, which are going to be really fun to play with, obviously. And then it, it's going to make all of them better because it's going to make it so that they draw cards and get mana. And dragons tend to have pretty high power, so you're gonna be getting a lot of mana out of it. I mean, like even just this thing alone is is gonna be buffing, it's gonna be giving itself mana in its hand, in your hand. You don't have to match gems. It just gives itself mana. And then it's also going to make it so that uh, you, when it deals damage, right? It's gonna draw a card and give it at least 10 mana. Now, what we don't know is if you have multiple copies of this thing in your hand, if the multiple copies will each give the dragons in your hand three mana, or like if you have a UR Dragon in play and you have a UR Dragon in your hand, if that means that each of them are going to give three, I don't know yet. It doesn't need to, and it's still going to be amazing. You want this card. You need this card. You should get this card. Vindictive Lich is a 12 mana 7-3. This one is not a chase card. It's just a card that I really want to play with and could wind up being phenomenal or it could wind up being okay. So when this creature dies, roll a d20. If that result is between one and 10, destroy a random opposing creature. Then your opponent loses life equal to that creature's power. If that result is an 11 to 19, your opponent discards their first card from their hand and you gain X mana, where X is the base cost of the discarded card. It doesn't matter how much mana they've put into the thing, it's just gonna be the base cost. So let's pretend for a moment that your opponent has the Tarrasque. We'll be meeting that soon. The thing costs 30 mana. And then because, you know, Greg likes to charge up creatures before they do anything and they do it by rarity, they've got the Tarrasque first. This thing dies and you get rid of the Tarrasque, you gain 30 mana. So uh, that's pretty cool. If you roll a 20, return this creature to the battlefield under your control. Now, 
This particularly stands out to me because of the Liliana of the first ability called Anoint that you destroy a creature of yours and then put it back onto the battlefield and turn it into a zombie. Anywho, you could just go ahead and choose to flicker this Vindictive Lich with the Death Flicker from Liliana. I think it's Death's Majesty. I always get them wrong. I don't know. I do think it's something like that. Whatever. It's, it's one of the Lilianas. And so every single turn, you're going to be able to make it because we have gem conversion coming out the rear, you're going to be able to make it so that you're either destroying a random opposing creature or your opponent's going to be discarding their first card and you're going to get a ton of mana basically every turn, with the only downside being you might actually roll a 20. And this is about the only instance where rolling a 20 is going to be bad for you. So yeah, anyhow, it could be very cool. Even if you're not playing it with that Liliana, just playing it in general, if your opponent kills the thing, it's going to do really bad things to them. So Having a 12 mana 7-3 that your opponent doesn't want to kill is definitely decent. Now this one is the last of the masterpieces on my list. So now let's go ahead and move on to the mythics. The first of our mythics is Dancing Sword. This is 15 mana. It's going to have three shields and it has that whole if you attack with a creature and it's in your hand it gains two mana. While on the board your first creature gets plus four plus two and gains double strike. Then when your first creature dies, you may exile this support. You don't have to. If you do, return the first creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield under your control. That creature's base power and toughness is increased by plus four, plus two. Then that creature gains double strike and flying and the construct subtype. So, whoa! Embercleave was already a really good card at 22 mana in giving your first creature plus two plus two double strike and berserker and I want to say trample. This thing gives your first creature plus four plus two instead of plus two plus two. So this thing costs seven less mana, gives you more power along with the double strike. It's adding eight power per turn minimum because of the whole, you know, plus four plus two. And then when your first creature dies, you may go ahead and choose to get rid of this support to bring a creature back from your graveyard, give it the effect of this support, but the effect of this support is going to increase the base power toughness, meaning that any subsequent copy of the creature that you play, or if it's something with leader that comes out, is going to get like super boosted for its reinforcements on top of having double strike and now flying. This card is crazy good, like super, super good. Big time chase card for me. I mean, double strike is already awesome, and this makes it more awesome. And it's a white equipment card that we're going to be able to use with Stoneforge Mystic. Hooray! Drizzt do Urden. Turden? I don't know. I'm not a big Drizzt fan. I know, I'm going to get like 50,000 dislikes for saying that. But whatever, it's, it's just because I haven't read those novels. It has nothing to do with my dislike of the character. Although I will say, I mean, like, you know, you look at this dude, right? I think Drizzt is a dude. It's just pretty sweet, right? Like, the dual wielding and the floofy hair and then the, the cat thing. But whatever. This is where my, my lack of MTG lore comes in clutch, but not really. So this is 15 for a 5-5 five five with double strike. That alone is already decent. When this creature enters the battlefield, create a... Oh, good lord token. Uh, the Gwenhuivar? Guinevere? I'm going to call it Guinevere. Yeah, we're going to say that's Guinevere. Uh, you're going to create a Guinevere token. And when another creature dies, if it had power greater than this creature's, this creature gets plus X plus X permanently, where X is equal to the difference. So that whole bottom text basically says, if another creature dies with power greater than Drizzt, then Drizzt's power becomes equal to that creature's power, right? That, that's it, basically. That, that's, that's, that, that, that's how that goes. So if you kill a big thing, Drizzt is gonna now become the biggest thing on the battlefield. Uh, but Drizzt is going to have double strike, which is cool. So I like that. But then we don't know what Guinevere is going to do yet. However, just I, I wasn't going to originally put this thing on my tier list because like 15 for a 5-5 five, five double strike is good, but not great. But I just have a feeling that because this is Drizzt and with just how the rest of the set looks, I just I just have this sneaking suspicion that Octagon's going to do something cool with Guinevere. So... No, I don't have any insider information. I feel like I always have to say that. They don't give me extra information about things, typically. Um, but, anywho, 
this card looks super cool. Ebon Death, Ebon Death, Draco Lich. So this is more a card that just I want to play with. I don't know that you will want to play with this as much as I want to play with it, but one of my favorite Planeswalkers and most used Planeswalkers is Liliana Untouched by Death, whose first ability mills eight cards from your deck. So anytime we see a reasonably costed, high-powered black creature that has a cool graveyard effect, I want to play with it. So this is 12 mana for a 7-4 with flying. At the beginning of your turn, this creature gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of graveyard gems. And when a creature enters a graveyard from anywhere, if this card is in your graveyard, create up to three graveyard gems. Now, because I could see myself totally playing with this using Garuda and Liliana, I could very well be dumping 16 cards into my graveyard on many different turns. And then as we factor in using something like Otrimi, which is going to guarantee that we throw even more creatures into our graveyard every single turn, I could just see there being lots of things creating lots of graveyard gems, which is going to mess with my opponent's gem conversion and is going to buff up my dragons, which are going to be going pew pew at my opponent, throwing bone stuff. So I like that. Looks cool. Not great. Just fun. And I want to play with it. Inferno of the Star Mounts. I mean, mounting a star would probably be a bad idea. Dragon or not. Just, I mean, I don't know. Like, unless you're thinking of, like, a star, like a celebrity. So maybe there's, like, dragon celebrities that this thing mounts. I don't know. But whatever. I mean, cool. All the more power to Inferno. But this is a 22 mana for an 8-8 flying and haste. It has level up, which many cards in this set do. It cannot have its mana drained or raised. And then it has activate four red. This creature gets plus two plus zero until end of turn if you match or destroy one of the activate gems. And then you increase this card's level by one. Then if this card's level is five or more, deal 20 damage to any opposing target. So you read that right there and you're like, ooh, yes please. Once we get this thing to level five, every time we level this up, it's going to do 20 damage and it activates 4. This card is bonkers. As long as this creature's power is 16 or greater, it gains double strike and trample. Even more bonkers. At the end of your turn, this card's level becomes 1. <laughs> Rip. Okay, so this is still really good though. Hold on, hold on, right? Because this it starts at level 1. So if you are able to actually match or destroy all four of those red gems then you're going to get the plus eight plus zero, which is going to put it to 16 power, which is gonna give it double strike and trample and deal an additional 20 damage to any opposing target. Let's pretend for a moment that you do that damage to your opponent. Between this thing hitting for 32 and dealing that 20 damage, just having Inferno of the Star Mounts is going to be able to do up to 52 damage, which is quite a lot of damage for one creature hitting your opponent. So. That's pretty cool. Now, we do have a bunch of things that do destroy activate gems. I'm looking at Zerta and I'm looking at Lithoform Engine. So this card could actually wind up being super fun and actually insanely decent, especially because I could foresee you being able to deal 20 damage to any opposing target every single turn. So you're gonna be able to end some games pretty quickly with Inferno of the Star Mounts. The only thing that would really be a limiter there is that this thing, <laughs> this thing costs 22 mana which is quite a lot, but with all the gem conversion we've got going right now, and with the existence of Planeswalkers like Koth, I don't know that that's an actual issue. Instrument of the Bards could wind up being a very good card. It's very fascinating. So it's, it's five mana, it's got three shields, it's got the level up mechanic, and it has mana field. So at the beginning of your turn, increase this card's level by three. So automatically, no matter what, Every turn, this thing's level increases by three. So that's gonna be pretty good. It starts at one, it's gonna go then from one to four, four to seven, seven to 10, and so on and so forth. But it's gonna level up pretty darn fast. Its mana field is gonna make it so the first historic card in your hand gains X mana, where X is this support's level. So, I mean, you're gonna be getting that level up really, really fast. So you're gonna start giving a ton of mana to those cards that are historic. If you were not playing in the Dominaria set, historic is any card that is legendary or is an artifact or is a vanguard, but vanguards are legendary. So anywho, vanguards, legendary cards, and support, sorry, supports, uh, artifacts count as historic. When this supports gem is matched, fetch the first historic card from your library. So if when you match the thing, 
the mana field is going to trigger. So the thing that I'm wondering is that if you match this thing, will you then fetch the card and then get the mana field, or is it going to trigger the mana field and then fetch the card? I don't know. Either way, this is going to be very good, though. Uh, it, part of what makes it so good is that it is also legendary itself, and so when you're matching around this thing, especially because this is a green support, and so as it is a green support, it's going to be falling victim to green gem conversion. It's going to probably get popped pretty easily, uh, but because you're going to be fetching those historic cards from your library and you're going to be giving them mana from the mana field, I imagine you'll be able to get multiple copies of Instrument of the Bards down, which will increase its shields, which will make it so it doesn't die as much and is able to serve as a battery for fetching and putting things on the battlefield for you, which is always a good thing. Next up is Ochre Jelly. Ochre Jelly is a four mana one one, which is already a big winner. <laughs> nah, it's actually good though. Bear with me. It's got a stored mana cost of 16, so you can give it up to 16 more mana and then you cast it. It's got Berserker and Trample. And when this creature enters the battlefield, it gets plus X plus X, where X is equal to half of the card's stored mana rounded down. So if you fill it up all the way to 16, it's going to enter the battlefield as a 9-9 nine, nine with Berserker and Trample. And then when this creature dies, create a copy of this card on the battlefield under your control. This creature gets plus Y plus Y. Y is equal to half of this creature's toughness rounded down. So let's say that you, you get this thing out as like a big kid, right? Uh, and then it, as a big kid, it comes out as a 9-9. Nine, nine. Your opponent kills it, it then dies, but it comes back with a copy and it comes back as a 4-4. Four, four. It dies again, it comes back as a 2-2. Two, two. It dies again, it comes back as a 1-1. One, one. It dies again, it's gone. But the thing is, is that if you buff this thing, then it's just going to keep coming back. If you have, say, a support out uh, that has, um, what are they called? Equipment. If you've got an equipment out and it's, it's boosting this thing's power toughness, then this thing foreseeably would just become an immortal thing unless your opponent exiles it, which is very nasty, especially considering that the thing has Berserker and Trample, so it's just going to keep whapping at your opponent's creatures and getting rid of them. I could see this actually being very strong and a righteous pain in the rear to get rid of, so I'm very excited to play with Ochre Jelly. Old Gnawbone. Old Gnawbone is just beautiful. I love this thing, especially with the card that comes next. So uh, this is 19 mana for a 9-9 with flying. It's got Legendary. And when a creature you control deals combat damage to your opponent's planeswalker, you're going to create X gold tokens, where X is this creature's base power. <laughs> so, oh man, X is this creature's base power. So, all right. This thing, it, whenever it hits, it's going to create nine gold tokens. Gold tokens are these little artifact supports that have one shield that, uh, when they're destroyed, are going to give you three mana. And so... This this thing is gonna make it so that you're just gonna you're you're gonna flood the world with gold tokens. You're gonna make so much gold with this thing. It's gonna be ridiculous. Uh, so you're gonna get a whole bunch of artifacts down, a, a lot of artifact supports. And uh, when those artifact supports get popped, you're gonna get a lot of mana, regardless of whether or not you pop them or your opponent pops them. And rest assured, your opponent will be trying to pop those supports. So. That means that when your opponent's trying to destroy your supports, aka Greg being a doofus, Greg is going to be giving you mana on top of giving Greg mana. And then when a creature you control deals combat damage to your opponent's planeswalker, you're going to create those gold tokens based on this creature's base power. I'm assuming it's going to be based on the base power of the creature that's attacking, or sorry, that's dealing the combat damage, not on Old Gnawbone. If it is based on Old Gnawbone, then that means if you've got three creatures down, you're going to be able to make... 27 gold tokens in a turn, which is just ridiculous. Uh, but even still, you can you can get to pretty close levels to that. Now, part of what really struck me about Old Knobbone is also that Oswald Fiddlebender is going to exist, uh, which is a 9-mana 4-4. It's a gnome artificer, and so my hatred of gnomes from my World of Warcraft days is going to not quite reach this thing, but still, I do kind of hate them. I kind of wish still that the Torin Stomp racial... If it hit a gnome, it would just auto-kill them in PvP, and then you would get a debuff on your Torin for like five seconds called Sticky Hooves from having squished the little buggers. But anyways, I digress. Oswald Fiddlebender. So this is 9 mana for a 4-4. Four, four. When an artifact you control is destroyed, increase this card's level by 3. Then move the first artifact card with the highest base cost that is equal to or less than this card's level from your library into play. 
If you haven't yet seen why I want to play this with Old Nawbone, uh, just wait, there's more. It's like an infomercial. Billy Nays here. When an artifact enters play under your control, increase this card's level by one. Then this creature gets a plus one, plus one boost. So, uh, yeah, this thing, you're going to be... You're, you're going to be making, what, nine gold tokens for this thing hitting, which is going to boost Fiddlebender by nine. And then when this thing hits, it's going to be making four more. Uh, so that's then going to go ahead and boost his power by another four, which is just between these two going to be boosting this thing's power by 13 and leveling it up by 13 every turn. And then when those artifact gold tokens get destroyed, this thing's level is going to be moving up even more. And you're just basically going to take all the artifacts with the highest base cost in your deck and putting them directly into play. So it's just going to be free artifacts for days. This thing's like Billy Mays meets Oprah and makes a gnome. Ugh, gnomes. But whatever, it's still going to be really cool. So yeah, I'm definitely going to try and make a white green deck off of these. In the event that I'm misunderstanding gold and they now stack and create one big thick stack of gold, uh, that's fine too. I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm not going to hate on that. It's still going to be beautiful. Ah, speaking of beautiful, this thing exists. I cannot wait to play with the Tarrasque. So, uh, the Tarrasque is kind of the coolest monster in Dungeons & Dragons, at least in my opinion. I've always wanted to kill one of these blighters, but I never have. I've just never gotten the wish down right. But, anywho, this is a 30 mana 2020 Berserker creature. Sorry, I'm laughing at the 2020 and 30 mana. It's just a creature about big things, you know? Big things. So... Uh, anyways, to the Tarrasque, 30 mana, 2020 with Berserker. When you cast this card, it gets Haste and Ward. So uh, the Haste is going to make it immediately swing in, and the Ward is going to make it so that your opponent will have to drain 10 mana from their hand in order to prevent this thing from getting Hexproof. Uh, then, so let's go back a step. When you cast this card, it gains Haste and Ward, then disable your opponent's creatures until end of turn. So... This, this is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. I, I'm going to be playing this thing in Legacy with Gishath for sure. Gishath, if you don't know, if you didn't play in the Ixalan days, you're missing out. The Dino days were kind of like the heyday for me. I love those Dinos. It also happened to be the first sets that Octagon made. Uh, but anywho, so Gishath is a 10-10 dinosaur that when it deals combat damage to your opponent's planeswalker, gives full mana to the first dinosaur in your hand. So the Tarrasque is going to be given full mana, and then it's going to get haste and ward, and then disable your opponent's creatures, and then just come in and start hitting like a Miley Cyrus, maybe a Nicolas Cage wrecking ball, which is going to just be absolutely deadly and amazing and beautiful. And if that wasn't enough, I mean, I mean, this is this thing is green, so you can put it in Brocon and then just get free Tarrasques for days with his third ability and start going zappy zappy. Now, unfortunately, it does not have Trample. I do feel like that's a little bit of an oversight for this massive beast. But nonetheless, I still cannot wait to play with this, and I love that it exists. Tiamat. Oh, good lord, this thing. All right, so this thing's crazy strong, too. This is, this is like a must-have card from the set, uh, just as the UR Dragon was, so... This is 21 mana for a 10-10. It has Leader Dragon and Flying. And it has, when you cast this card, fetch up to the first five different dragon cards from your library that are not named Tiamat. Those cards gain half of their mana. Those cards gain Enchanted. When this creature enters the battlefield, reinforce it. Good gracious. All right, this thing is all five colors. And it's just going to do incredibly dirty things to the world. Having Leader Dragon is actually very relevant, given that there is a card in the set that will be able to turn creatures into the subtype Dragon, meaning that you'll be able to take a token stack, turn them into dragons, and have Tiamat eat them all. Yum. But if that wasn't enough, Brocon's second ability is going to be able to boost this critter. And if that wasn't enough, it's a 10-10 dragon god so i mean it it's gonna fetch all your other dragons so you're gonna play v v tiamat and then all of its buddies aka velomachus are gonna be coming into your hand the ur dragon is gonna be coming into your hand all these big dragons are gonna get reinforced you use brocon's third brocon is looking beautiful with this set by the way everyone if 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 you haven't been playing with Brocon lately, like me, like I, I haven't played with Brocon seriously in forever. I just don't use him anymore at all. Uh, some of that's because I don't play Legacy, but with this set, Brocon is going to become the Dragon Lord of all Lords and be 
filthy. Tiamat is good. You want Tiamat, get Tiamat. Vorpal Sword. This is 14 mana. It's got that when your first creature, or when your creatures attack, it gets 3 mana. It's got level up. While on the board, your first creature gets plus 6, plus 0, and gains death touch. When your first creature deals combat damage to your opponent's planeswalker, gain X loyalty, where X is equal to this support's level. Then this card's level increases by 2. So when your first creature deals combat damage to your opponent's planeswalker, put two levels on it, and then gain loyalty equal to the levels on this thing. That's crazy! That's so good! Like, especially if you have, like, a double strike critter that's going to be hitting twice and is going to be boosting the thing's level by four every turn. Like, you're going to just be able to spam loyalty abilities like nobody's business. This is an absolutely phenomenal card. It's so cool that it's, like, a black equipment, too, because, you know, like, this is this is the, the, the first coming of black being one of the most powerful set colors in Puzzle Quest. So good. Vorpal Sword is going to be very, very good. I like this card very, very much. It's going to honestly be uh, something that I very much do not want to face in the hands of a, a skilled player. Like, you put this on uh, pretty much any of the bow losses, and it turns into kill something every single turn. Like, I mean, you you just get so much value out of this card, or even, like, Tybalt. Uh, Tybalt, I love you. But anyways, this card is really good. I see it because it's going to be in standard for quite a while now. I see it being a mainstay in PvP. This thing's going to be nasty. In PvE, it's going to be nasty. Great card all around. Westgate Regent. Speaking of terrifying, this thing's going to exist. So th this thing is 16 mana for a 4-4 flying and ward. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, the ward cost is going to be to pay life. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pay that 8 life to kill this thing 100% of the time. I could be at 8 life and I would kill myself to have the opportunity to kill this thing because it's going to be so good. So when this creature deals combat damage to your opponent's Planeswalker, it gets a permanent plus X plus X boost where X is this creature's power. What? So basically, when this creature deals combat damage to your opponent's Planeswalker, double this thing's power. If you give this thing double strike, I don't know, Ember Cleave or that new dancing sword nonsense that gives plus four, plus two, and double strike, this thing is going to boost so fast. Even if this thing didn't have a power boost, you just give the bugger double strike. The first time it hits, it's going to hit for four, boost to four, right? boost four, so it's going to boost to eight, and then hit for eight. So it hits for 12 total, uh, and then when it goes, it hits for four, right? Gets that boost to eight, it hits for the eight, and it boosts to 16. On your next turn, it's going to hit for 16, boost to 32, hit for 32, boost to 64. Oh my gosh, it does so much damage, guys. So much damage. That's what, 12? And then I did so bad with numbers in my head. There was the 16 and the 32 together, which is what, 48 on the 12 is 60. Two turns of this thing attacking with double strike is 60 damage. Oof. And it just gets worse from there for your opponent. This thing is nasty. This thing is really, really good. This is a big time chase card for me. I very much like the Westgate Regent. The Westgate Regent is much good. Xanathar, Guild Kingpin. I believe this is the last one for the Mythics on my lists. This one is more one that I'm just curious to see how it plays because it could wind up being great or it could just wind up being meh. It's gonna be one of those two. It's not gonna be bad. It's just either gonna be great or meh. It won't be just good, I don't think. So it's it's 18 mana for a 7-8. When your opponent makes their first match each turn, disable the first spell card with mana in your opponent's hand until end of turn. Oh, okay. So you wanted to remove my stuff. No. At the end of your opponent's turn, you may pick one of the first spell cards from your opponent's hand, copy it into your hand, and give it mana equal to the mana in that card. So... It says pick one of the first spell cards. I imagine this is just going to be the first spell card in your opponent's hand. But nonetheless, it'll be cool to know a card that's in your opponent's hand. It'll just be like, boom, I know what card's in your hand. I know what you're going to try and play. I don't want you to play it. No, no. So I, I do like the look of this card. I like the idea of this in disabling your opponent from being able to play removal against you. And you get a sneak peek of what your opponent has. And you get to cast it back at them. So nonetheless... It seems, as you can tell, like it would be really, really good, potentially. 
or really meh? I don't know. Some of what will make it good or meh is that it says when they make their first match, you then disable the first thing with mana. But the thing is, is do they make the match and then is it does it try to disable before they gain their mana or do they gain their mana and then it tries to disable? You know, so we'll just have to see. But that's that. That does it for the mythics. This one is definitely the last mythic. So now let's go ahead and check out the rares. If you've made it here and you're thinking, oh my gosh, we're only at the third rarity and there's two more to go. Nalthazar, why are you putting this all in one video? It's because almost all of my chase cards are mythics and masterpieces from this set. There are two uncommons, one common, and then a few rares. So don't worry, you're close to the end. And as I say that, I hear the screams of anguish from all of my free-to-play friends as they hear me say that and go, oh no, mythics and masterpieces. <sighs> but fear not. These rares are crazy good, and you're going to want them. So the first one is Cave of the Frost Dragon. This is a 9-mana land. At the beginning of your turn, convert two gems to white. Pause. We're going to stop here. We have a new land cycle that's going to convert to a specific color. You might be like, wait, come on. We didn't need that. We have a bunch. But remember that we're going to be losing the... Uh, Eldraine sets soon, right? So we're going to have a standard shift soon. It's not happening with this set, but we're going to have a standard shift soon. And when that standard shift happens, we're going to lose the Eldraine lands, which is a set of two for each color that are 10 mana lands that give us gem conversion. So this is going to continue our fueled gem conversion for a while especially if you factor in that we also recently got a new land cycle from the Zendikar set. So we're going to still have gem conversion for days, and this costs one less mana. They're nine mana instead of ten mana. And before I get into them, I'm just going to go ahead and spoil just a little piece, which is that this is maybe the best land cycle that has ever been introduced into Puzzle Quest. These things are ridiculous. I don't know. Anyways, let's get back to the Cave of the Frost Dragon. This is nine mana. It's got four shields instead of the customary three that you see on most lands. At the beginning of your turn, convert two gems to white. Then, if there are ten or more white gems, your first white creature gets plus four plus four and flying until end of turn. That creature gains the dragon subtype until end of turn. If, you know, you were thinking with the Tiamat card, Nalthazar, are you going to show us one of those cards that turns things into dragons? Yes, I am. With this, you just get to start turning all those little white human tokens into dragons. And then all those little white humans actually just become Tiamats, which are 1010s, which are terrifying. So that's pretty cool, right? The only downside is that you're only going to be able to do that once, uh, because once the humans turn into Tiamat, Tiamat's going to be taking the first place for your creatures, and Tiamat is indeed white, as Tiamat is all colors. So, anywho... This thing converts gems, and then if there are 10 or more white gems, right? Or more. So all of them have that. All of them are going to be convert two gems to their color, and then if there are 10 or more of the color. But you're converting gems to the color. So ideally, you're playing multiple things that are going to be converting to your colors, and so you're going to be getting the effects, hopefully, every turn. So every turn, not only are you going to convert gems to white, but you're also going to be giving your first white creature plus four, plus four, and flying. And the added fun sub bonus of turning them into dragons. I give that two thumbs up. Den of the Bugbear. This one is the red one. So once again, nine mana, four shields, convert two gems to red. If there are 10 or more red gems, create a goblin token. Blah, a one, one token, come on. Then your first red creature gets plus three, plus two, and gains haste until end of turn. That creature gains the goblin subtype until end of turn. I'm just laughing at the idea of it turning things into goblins. Uh, you could use this with the goblin guide, um, which is a leader for goblins, and then just start ramping up tokens. At the very least, though, the den of the bugbear is going to convert gems to red, and then is going to give you, if you've got no other creatures down, a goblin token, which is a 1-1, one, one, give it 3-2 in haste, which means it's going to be swinging for 4, and if your opponent gets rid of the goblin token the next turn, you're probably just going to get another one. So this is, once again, very solid. Not only is it going to be converting gems to red, but it has very nice shields, very low mana cost, and is going to be killing your opponent. 
Dragon Turtle is going to be taking a moment to interrupt our land cycle. Uh, Dragon Turtle is a 15 mana 5-7. It has Defender and Ward to drain 5 mana from hand, and while on the battlefield, the first opposing creature is disabled. If you were not playing at the time of that annoying spirit thing that disabled the first creature, this thing is that but worse, because it also has Ward, which means it's going to be more of a pain in the butt to get rid of the thing. And it has Vigilance instead of like Defender or Reach, so it will selectively block things that it won't die to, which means it'll not only be protecting the person by preventing them from dying, but it will also be disabling the stuff and harder to kill. So I love turtles. I'm not going to love facing this thing. I'm going to be honest. This thing's going to be a pain in the butt, but it's a good card. So it's on the list. And I like turtles because turtles. Guardian of Faith. <laughs> I know I'm laughing a lot in this video. It's just because, like I said, there's there's a lot of stuff in this set that's just sort of like, eh, but then there's a few cards in this set that you read it and you're like, wait a minute. Did I read that right? Is, it, is this that good? And yes, I think that Guardian of Faith is. So this is 14 mana for a 5-4 with Vigilance. When this creature enters the battlefield, exile each other creature you control. All right, so that's that's the downside to this thing, right? It's going to exile each other creature you control when it enters the battlefield. And then, at the end of your turn, return the first two different creatures from your exile to the battlefield with their reinforcements. What? So... <laughs> All right, this thing just passively has, at the end of your turn, return the first two different creatures from your exile to the battlefield under your control with their reinforcements. So once you get this thing down, you no longer need to spend mana to cast your creatures. All right, you just, you, you take them from your hand and you throw them away. You put them into exile by dropping them from your hand. And then voila, Guardian of Faith is going to return all of them back to the battlefield with their reinforcements. Now, as of the time of my recording this, there is no effect that I know of that actually returns things with their reinforcements to the battlefield. It just brings like one back. But even still, with this, it, getting two free creatures, up to two free creatures a turn without having to pay their mana is crazy good. Like, what, <laughs> what is this thing? Oh man, this thing is just totally butts. Like, it's so good if it works that way. Every turn, two creatures from your exile. Throw it away from your hand. Goodness gracious. This card is beautiful. You want it. You must have it. I must have it. Use it. It'll be very good. Hall of Storm Giants. This is going to continue the whole blue is got like what conversion, right? So this is nine mana. It has four shields. Convert two to blue. If there are ten or more blue gems, your first blue creature gets plus seven, plus seven until end of turn. Oh my goodness. You know, the, the first one had plus four, plus four for, for white. The red one gave plus three, plus two. You know what, blue? Let's give you plus seven, plus seven. Turn it into a giant, and oh wait, let's also give it then drain five mana from the first spell card in your opponent's hand. Oh man, if it wasn't enough to give this thing the greatest power toughness boost we've seen from one of these lands so far, let's go ahead and give it mana drain on top of that. So... Yeah, Hall of the Storm Giants is crazy good, guys. You, you have to have this card. Honestly, you have to have all of the land cycle from this set. They're so good. Like, seriously, it's ridiculous. Plus seven, plus seven, gem conversion, mana drain for a four shield support. Oh, gosh, this thing is so good. Hive of the Eye Tyrant. All right, this is nine mana. This is the black one, so you're going to convert two to black, and if there are ten or more black gems, exile the first card with Buried from the opposing graveyard. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would rather drain five mana from the first spell in my opponent's hand than get rid of things with buried from my opponent's graveyard. But that's more a product of buried being garbage and uh, draining mana from my opponent's hand being rightfully terrifying. Then your first black creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains menace until end of turn. That creature gains the beholder subtype until end of turn. I would honestly still rather have plus seven plus seven instead of the uh, plus three plus three in Menace. But whatever. I th This is just me being picky. Th this is a fantastic card. It's going to convert two gems to black. It's going to give your first black creature plus three plus three. That's it. That, that That's fantastic. No complaints. Except for blue being better. Oh, blue, why? Uh, <laughs> and then there's the green one, right? Okay, okay. So, so blue and green are historically the best colors in Puzzle Quest. The, they're just ridiculous. 
And somehow blue has recently encroached upon green as the best color for conversion because, you know, things like Urza exist and then before that Storm the Vault existed. But this, this land right here has to about be the best land that's ever existed. So this is, this is a, I mean, apart from Urza's land, but I'm not counting that as a land that you get to cast, right? Because you have to cast Urza. So this is nine mana. It's, it's got the four shields. Convert two to green. Then if there's 10 or more green gems, your first green creature gets plus X plus X and trample until end of turn. X is the number of green gems. That creature gains the Hydra subtype until end of turn. So you might be like, wait, Michael, this is, this could be random. You know, like it's, it's the number of green gems. But remember, there have to be at least 10 green gems for this to activate, meaning that your first green creature is going to be getting a minimum of plus 10, plus 10. Whereas black is getting plus 3, plus 3. Red is getting plus 3, plus 2. White is getting plus 4, plus 4. Blue is getting plus 7, plus 7. Green is getting a minimum plus 10, plus 10. But this is green we're talking about here. So you're probably going to have somewhere in the 15 to 20 green gems, which means, oh my Lantas, this support's so good. Oh geez, you're going to be buffing your creatures so much. And it gives them trample. You know what? Let's just give the added bonus of green creatures need trample. So yeah, Quartz would crash your loves this thing, you know? Totally. Yeah. Forget that it's a Hydra, you know? Cut off Quartz would hash crasher's head. Eight more emerge. That'd be horrifying. It's not that good, but it is like phenomenal good. Paladin class. All right. This is the first of our class cards. Uh, there, this is, I think the only class card. No, 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 no. There's one in the uncommon range that I put in, but the classes are not great on the whole. However, that's just how they look to me at first glance. That said, they are, it's a really cool idea. So it's, it's 11 mana. It's got three shields. It has resilience. So when you match it, it won't lose shields. It's got level up. And then this support cannot be reinforced. What that means is that you can play multiple copies of Paladin class, and then you will get the effects of multiple of those classes uh, for, for each one that you have out, right? It's gonna be a stacking thing. So that'll be true for all the classes. All the classes are like this. So for the Paladin class, when a creature you control with a basic evergreen ability attacks, increase this card's level by one. If this card's level is three or more, that creature gets plus X plus X and gains double strike until end of turn. X is the number of creatures and creature reinforcements you control up to three. So basically this could give all of your creatures plus three plus three until end of turn and double strike, which is so sweet. We love double strike. Double strike is good. Giving double strike to all of your creatures is great. This makes paladins great again, guys. Look at that. Plus three, plus three to all creatures. That's plus nine. Double strike, that's plus 18. And then you you add whatever the power is of all of your other creatures, and this can, can put out a lot of damage. Yes, the paladins really can put out here. So when this card level becomes five, your creatures get a permanent plus three, plus three buff. And while on the board, non-support cards in your opponent's hand, aka spells and creatures, are gonna cost three more to cast. So all around, paladin class is phenomenally good. Uh, I imagine that if you're using this card, you're going to be making it so that the other creatures in your deck are all going to have evergreens so that they are going to be able to get the double strike, which is fantastic. So yeah, this card is uh, quite good. The next up on the list is Skeletal Swarming. I just love this card. I love everything about it. I love, I think the picture is really cool, but I just think that the flavor, everything about this card, fantastic. So this is 14 mana. It's got four shields. It's an enchantment support. It is green and black. While on the board, your skeleton creatures gain Berserker and Trample. When a skeleton creature you control attacks, that creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each skeleton you control, including their reinforcements. At the end of your turn, create two skeleton tokens. Morbid, so if a creature died this turn, instead create three skeleton tokens. So, here's the thing. You run no other skeletons in your deck. Every turn, you're creating two skeleton tokens that uh, basically just double in power, right? So whatever the power is of your skeletons, it's basically gonna double because they get plus one, plus one for each skeleton you control, including reinforcements. So those two skeletons you get are actually four fours when they attack and they're gonna have Berserker. So they're gonna be throwing themselves at your opponent's creatures, whittling them down and ultimately killing them. Then when the opponent's creature dies or the skeleton dies, either or, the skeleton is going to be now coming back in even greater force. Because let's say that your, your skeleton throws itself at the opposing creature, it dies, 
It's now going to, at end of turn, come back as a, yes, you guessed it, a 3-3 three, three skeleton, which is actually a 6-6 six, six skeleton because of the ability of this thing, which is going to have Berserker and is just going to keep throwing itself. So it's kind of like you've got this never-ending undead horde that's going to keep throwing itself at your opponent's creatures and killing them. And then once you have killed them, you're just going to keep building up your skeleton army, and when they play more, it's just going to make the skeleton army stronger. So, yes, I love skeletal swarming. If we give these things first strike, ooh, watch out. The skeletons are coming. It is beautiful. I like very much. So, Skeletal Swarming is the last of the rares. That means we've got three cards to go. Let's go ahead and check out the uncommons. The first of our uncommons is Druid Class. So this is the second of the class cards. It is a 10 mana support with three shields. It has Resilient and Mana Field and Level Up. This support cannot be reinforced, just like all the other classes, so you can have multiple copies of Druid class down on the battlefield and get all of their effects. It's going to have Mana Field to increase the card's level by 1, convert 2 gems to green, and then if this card's level is 3 or more, instead convert 4 gems to green instead. Furthermore, it has Landfall Green, so if you match 4 or more green gems, you're going to gain 3 life. And when this card's level becomes 4, your first creature gets plus X plus X permanently and gains Trample, where X is the number of green gems up to 8. So this basically is going to have a whole bunch of abilities that all work together in wonderful harmony to be fantastic. So the mana field to convert gems to green and level it up is, is already decent, but what makes this card really cool is that it can't be reinforced. So if you get multiple druid classes down, they are green, meaning that they're going to be on green gems, uh, at least initially. And then, you know, as they get matched, they're going to change colors because of how the resilient works. But nonetheless, uh, it, they're going to enter the battlefield, they're going to be a bunch of supports, and then as the mana field triggers for the druid class, it's going to start converting gems to green. And if you have multiple of these things down, it's just going to start chaining because the, the gems are likely to convert and give you a match. And if it's in the mana field of another druid class, it's going to convert more gems and more gems and more gems. Uh, and then all of those are going to make it so that you're gaining life when you're getting the landfall. And then when the level becomes four for each of the druid classes, you're going to give a creature of yours, let's just face it, plus eight plus eight permanently. So... That's going to be giving you mana, it's going to be giving you life, and it's going to be permanently buffing your creatures. I see this as being a very good card for Popper. Uh, I see it as being a very solid card for newer players, and so I think this card looks really fun, and at the very least, decent, you know, as uncommons go. The other uncommon for me is here just because I've really taken to Popper PvP. I've had a lot of fun with Popper PvP. Uh, if you have not yet entered the PvP scene, uh, I urge you to go ahead and try it out. It's very fun. Um, but this card here, Loathsome Troll, is just a solidly good card. It's 13 mana for a 7-3 with Berserker. And when this creature dies, roll a d20. If it's 1 to 10, exile the card. It's just gone. Uh, 11 to 19 is going to return it to your hand. And 20 is going to return it to the battlefield. Now, what's really great about this is that it basically gives you a 7-3 Berserker that has a 50% chance of coming back to you in some way when it dies. So it sort of is going to serve as creature removal, but it's got a really big power, right, at 7 power. So it's going to be kind of scary. Uh, and if your opponent doesn't actually have any creatures down, it's, it's just going to start hitting them. And there's really not a lot that's going to be surviving that 7 power if it does hit them. So it just makes this a solid card. And I really like it, especially for that Popper PvP, uh, just as it's going to be wiping out your opponent's creatures, it's going to bypass Hexproof, which is an issue for Popper, and then it's going to be hitting your opponent pretty hard. So I like this one very much. With that, let's go to our final card. It is a common, so let's hit up that common. Grim Bounty is our common. It's kind of our token sort of common uncommon removal spell. It is 8 mana, it's black, destroy target creature, create a gold token. Now, I know that I generally put a lot of the removal cards from the common and uncommon range in here, especially ones that have a very reasonable mana cost, like 8. But this one is particularly worth noting, because more and more of our removal these days has been destroy like the first opponent's creature, or destroy target opponent creature. But there's very little that's just destroy target creature. 
and this card has destroy target creature. This is important because there are times when you want to be able to have the flexibility to destroy your own creature, be it for an objective where you need to lose X or more creatures, or just so that you don't kill your opponent too quickly so that you can go ahead and meet whatever the objective is for the event that you're playing. So this is going to let you target any creature and it's going to give you a gold token. The gold token is a lesser thing, the destroy target creature, any creature that doesn't have hexproof for your opponent uh, is, is really what makes this card very good. So it just adds to the removal that is currently fairly limited that allows us to get rid of targeted creatures. So that's it for my chase cards so far from the set. Uh, as we learn more about Forgotten Realms, uh, there may be more cards that I wind up throwing into the chase cards. I'm really excited to cover a lot of this set. Uh, I, I really like the idea of all of the dragons. As a person who is going to ultimately get all the cards for the set, uh, for me personally, having a lot of the cards in the Mythic and Masterpiece range is just going to keep my, my VIP pulls really exciting. However, I recognize that for a lot of you who do not get the VIP, that that's going to be a little bit of a bummer just because most of the set's power seems to be held behind the mythic and masterpiece range there's very little outside of the um the the gem converters that is like really good in the common uncommon rare range so this seems to be maybe the the one of the weaker bottom sets uh, that, that I've seen while still maintaining a lot of strength in the top in terms of the rarity. So I'm hoping that I'm proven wrong with this. I'm hoping that there's going to be more cards that wind up actually being better than I think they are. Uh, but this is just these are just my opinions at first glance. So if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching the video. If you didn't make it this far, thank you anyways, even though you're not hearing me say it. I do really appreciate you all taking the time to watch my videos. Um, those of you who are in my Discord and are chatty and uh, who comment on the videos, I appreciate you very much. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.